Good afternoon. Welcome. Um, you probably heard um, the chimes have already played God Bless America uh, today in honor of 9-11. In fact, we played it three times. And um, I remember that day that before Twitter and Facebook, but we had email, um, a notice went out saying that there would be a candlelight vigil on the arts quarrel. And 13,000 people showed up for that moment. And I know there are people here who were in some way affected by 9-11, either in a distant way or a very intimate way, and that this is a day for meditation and reflection. And um, for those of you who um, came anyway, I want to welcome you especially to our, what I think is going to be a joyous event. Uh, that we call Shop Talk. Um, and welcome all the rest of you as well. Uh, I think everybody knows that world literature has been written without um, the advice, or most of world literature has been written without the advice of an English professor. Um, but at this very moment in our history, uh, very little is published without the advice and help of the uh, editors and agents, which is what we have here today. We have one poet who's an editor, one literary agent, and an editor at a major American literary press. First, I'd like to welcome John Hennessy, who teaches at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, is also a poet who's published two collections of poetry, Coney Island Pilgrims, and Bridge and Tunnel, and who in 2011 founded a pretty remarkable uh, literary magazine that's both a print journal and um, a digital yeah. uh, journal. Uh, pardon? That named The Common. And I think he should be the one to tell you where that wonderful name uh, comes from and what it signifies but it signifies a common area, among other things, Absolutely. as well as, um, as some other interesting things. Um, the Common has published, in only three plus years, hundreds and hundreds of writers and also published graphic work. There are so many that I can't uh, name them all, but I picked a selection, beginning with um, James Franco, that James Franco. <laughs> I know he's ubiquitous, isn't he? What must it be like to be James Franco? Uh, Major Jackson, Brett Anthony Johnson, David Lehman, um, that seems very cunning because he's the editor of Best American Poetry, uh, but also a major uh, American poet. Pablo Neruda, uh, obviously dead, but they have a translation uh, and have been doing translations. Don Cher, who was here uh, a year ago, Mary Jo Salter, Teresa Svoboda, Edith Wharton, uh, and many other hundreds of people. And right now they're publishing Aishan Hutchinson. So we, 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 this is a very impressive list. And he's even more impressive than Edith Wharton. Uh, we're also welcoming Valerie Borchard from the Georges Borchard Agency. Uh, it was founded by Georges and Anne Borchardt in 1967. Its original list of authors, not surprisingly, was uh, dominated by people who were French or writing in French. And uh, some of these people are still represented by the agency in, uh, in the, under the states. Uh, and it includes, um, it's an amazing, Barth, Samuel Beckett, uh, Pierre Bourdieu, uh, Deleuze, Marguerite Duran, um, Foucault, Ionesco, uh, who uh, uh, you know was Romanian but wrote in uh, French, Lacan, Rome Grier, uh, Sartre, Elie Wiesel. I mean, those, that's just a selection of the, uh, the astounding list uh, that they have. Presently, most of their writers are English language writers, um, and they include poets and scholars as well as fiction writers. John Ashbery, Robert Bly, T. Corregus and Boyle, uh, Joan Jacobs Blumberg, who's a, a emeritus professor here, uh, Mary Capanegro, Robert Coover, Stanley Crouch, Charles Johnson, um, Pulitzer Prize winner, 
uh, Fred Kaplan, Tracy Kidder, Ian McEwen, um, Susan Minor, John Retchie, Richard Rodriguez, George Steiner, Judy Troy, and again, uh, Ely Fiesel. Uh But I, I'm saving the best. Adam Price is in this room today. Yeah. <laughs> and Stephanie Vaughn. And Stephanie And then Ethan Nasowski mm -hmm. from Gray Wolf Press. Not New York, but uh, a much greater city. Minneapolis. You're now in Minneapolis rather than uh, St. Paul? Or St. They, they are in Minneapolis, I, but I work for them from California. You work from California. That's, that's uh, going to bring up the digital question we were just talking about. Uh, an astounding uh, list that Gray Wolf has. I'll just read a few. Elizabeth Alexander, Robert Bly, Robert Boswell, Kate Braverman, Joseph Campagna, um, Vikram Chandra, Martha Collins, Mark Gaudi, Gerald Early, Alice Fulton from Cornell, Dana Joya, Rachel Ingalls, Khaled Madawa, Harriet Mullen, Carl Phillips, Salvatore Shibona, Charles Simic, Tracy K. Smith, uh, Melanie Ray Thon, Thomas Tr uh, Tomas, excuse me, Tron Stoma, uh, Nobel Prize, uh, Natasha Trethaway. Also, James Franco. True. <laughs> True. <laughs> Rilke, Dante, and J. Robert Lennon. <laughs> um, your poster, the poster you may have read announcing this, says, Shop Talk, learn the ins and outs of the publishing industry with literary agent Valerie Borchardt, editors John Hennessy and Ethan Nasowski. These experts will share their experience and will talk about the kind of writing that grabs their attention. Bring your questions. Well, we're going to ask each of them to speak and then open this up to your uh, questions. But I thought we might uh, begin with a big question that you can do whatever you want to with, which is uh, what you, as uh, people uh, who see a side of the profession we don't see, uh, think is happening to the book as an artifact? Is it going to disappear? Should we be selling our bookcases and giving our books to the friends of the library sale? Is it already gone? Um, is, is are fiction and poetry going to disappear, even in their virtual form? Are we going to have only YouTube readings? That, that is, will everything devolve into a performance? Um, or do you see something else happening? Maybe things happening uh, simultaneously. Maybe there's a spectrum of possibilities. Um, and uh, I thought we might start with John. Sure because you're working in both the digital and... Right, and I can keep it specific to what we do. If, if you see, and I have free copies that I'll bring to the reception, this is a beautifully designed magazine. Um, it comes out twice a year, but we also do digital, simultaneous, free publication, okay? Uh, with, with a, our philosophy is that if you want to buy a book, you'll buy a book. If, if you're going to read it online, and that's how you like to read please read our, what we offer you, please do. And we also offer um, online content that is not in the print journal. Five days a week, new, new material. I do a monthly poetry feature. Um, sometimes it's a single author, sometimes as many as 10. Uh, and we're going to do uh, a couple of anthologies this way with, say, three monthly installments. We'll do uh, one on Chinese poetry coming up very soon. We're doing one on Korean poetry, um, probably in the next month. Uh, if Amherst College, which sponsors us, had its way, um, the new Amherst College Press, and we're their first publication, it would be strictly digital. And it would be free. The model that, that but again, this is an academic press. And their, their thinking is, if we, because Amherst College uh, is, is such a wealthy institution, they can afford to keep scholarship going this way, they may as well. So they have to hire people to work there, and then the, the other costs are very low. I, I don't know if they're going to pay their, the, we pay our contributors, I don't know if they'll pay their authors, though. Um, you're right, I don't know. You'll have, it hasn't happened yet. Uh, when we run the print issue, we have to raise the money ourselves. We do it through events, parties, uh, donors, uh, 
and of course sales and subscriptions. Uh, but really, you, you, we do need money from outside. I was going to say that when I saw that question, it really made me look more to the past and how there's just a history of people always being worried about what's going to happen to the book and what is going to happen to authors and how you know, horribly paid authors are. And um, one thing that came to mind was, was the paperback. I mean, paperbacks have not been around that long. I think they were you know, maybe late 30s, early 40s. I believe they were created for GIs so they could carry them around in their back pockets. And I'm guessing, even though I wasn't around, that at that time, people in the publishing industry were freaking out. Like, what if this is the only way that people are going to read now? And, it, you know, it looks terrible and it's cheaper. And, you know, and then it, it evolved and there were beautiful trade paperbacks. And books have always, you know, there's just a... a a progression of the different ways in which they've been sold and people have always historically complained so when it went from you know the mom and pop nice little bookstore which we all love to the to the malls everyone thought that was awful too but actually more people were able to buy books and now that a lot of people buy things on the internet it's available to even more people and um, you know, even ebooks. I I like to think that now people who wouldn't normally be reading things are reading them because it's so easy for them to get them. So even though I don't love the idea of reading things that way, and I really don't believe that books are going to disappear, I, I I'm not against all these new things. But one thing that I did find, we're in the process of moving offices from uh, the 14th floor to the 12th floor, and we're going to a much smaller space. So we're sort of uncovering all these artifacts as we try and figure out what to throw away and actually I believe my father's been doing this since like 1956 not the 60s so I mean, we literally were finding 1099s for our authors from the early 60s you know he kept everything but I just thought this was funny because I found this isn't that old it's from 2001 I have to find the cover from the LA Times book <laughs> review and it says is publishing dead? So if you go through this, it, it, everybody is talking about the exact same things that they're talking about now, and they're worrying about electronic publication. And you know, I worried about it. I worried about it too, but I think I feel pretty positive about publishing in general. I think that the most important thing is the author, and so as long as the author is around and the author, if they're writing with a quill or they're writing with a pencil or they're writing with a ballpoint or on their typewriter or on their computer, it doesn't matter because they're the most important thing. So as long, you know, even if it did turn out, which it's not, I really believe it's not going to happen, that books were like only read on YouTube, it would still be the off, you know, the author That's would true. be the important person and they'd still be getting their, their work out there. So. Yeah, I think um, Valerie makes an important distinction, which is, um, you know, what, what's the, there, sort of, there's a business issue about publishing here, and there's an art issue about writing. And um, I certainly have zero fears about writing and literature. I mean, I guess there's an open question whether people like there'll be whether there'll be jobs for people like Valerie and me in 20 years. But um, but that's not as important, except to me. I think the important thing for publishers in terms of the physical artifact, and we make more money on a print book than we do on an electronic book. So our business models hinge on the existence of print in a pretty um, significant way. I think what's super important is the publishers have to make an object that's nice enough that people would rather buy it than, than buy an ebook. And uh, you know, I've worked for three publishers in my, you know, I've been in publishing for 20 years and um, I've worked for uh, Ferris, Strauss and Giroux and Grey Wolf and McSweeney's. And, all three are places that take some care um, with the way they produce the physical objects. McSweeney's obviously to the point of fetishizing them. And um, I think the, uh, you know, they try to make it worth your money. And, and, and what's certainly happened in the industry over the past several years, and publishers were quaking in their boots about whether ebooks were going to eat into their revenues. But uh, 
but ebooks have kind of plateaued. Um, um, the, 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 re the readers have now saturated the market. You know, the people who want, they're getting cheap enough that the people who really want an e-reader can buy one. So we're um, seeing what the kind of level of desire and, um, is for the ebooks. And um, they were, you know, ebook sales were going like that for like several years. And now they've kind of gone like that. So I think the, the fear among publishers has um, subsided a bit. Um, certainly it's surprised, I think, a lot of us who have been in the business for a while. I remember when I was a young editor at Ferris, Strauss and Giroux, and I remember in the late 90s, a couple of guys came in to present their fancy new electronic reading device called the um, Pocket, the, the Rocket eBook, or the Rocket eReader, I think it was called. And um, I remember they walked in our office with this kind of thick, clunky thing that was book-sized, and we, they gave us one that we could sort of play around with, and so the guy in the rights department who had it invited us in to sort of play with it, and, I just sort of, and it took ages for the pages to turn, you know, for the page refresh, and it was sort of thick and heavy, and all of us at this, you know, buddy-duddy old publisher were like, oh, God, these things are no threat. They're horrifying. You know, nobody's going to want to read this way ever, and um, of course that changed radically, and now we see that pe lots of people do want to read that way. So. Um, one thing, I guess one other mini story I'll tell is, uh, and it was interesting, and it, or it's, maybe it's just an evidence of what I was just saying, but while I was at McSweeney's, we published the, uh, a book by David Byrne from Talking Heads called How Music Works, and we made, you know, a super nice um, looking book. You know, this puffy cover, a lot of the images, color images inside, it was really, you know, an amazing sort of physical object, and it was a big bestseller, and when you have bestsellers, the percentage of ebooks is quite a lot higher than it might be for your average novel. Um, what was super interesting to me is we sold, it was like 15% were ebooks, and we spent a lot of time making this ebook with audio files and all this stuff. People didn't buy it. You know, they, they wanted the physical book because we'd made something that was super nice looking. So I think I'll just end there that I, I, I think there will continue, you know, ebooks are going to be a major piece of, of the kind of writing that you guys are doing and um, very important to our companies, and I think it's going to. Change, you know, move in directions that we still don't even can't even really imagine. But uh, um, but I, it seems I'm pretty confident that there's an ongoing and strong part of the market that's going to be print. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to give one example. I mean, probably our biggest backlist, best-selling book is Ellie Wiesel's Night, mm -hmm. and historically it's always sold about a quarter of a million copies a year. And then when it was in Oprah selection, you know, went up to about half a million copies. What we're finding now is that it still sells a quarter million copies a year, but then there's a whole other ebook component, and they don't seem to be eating into each other. I, I don't know exactly why, but... We, we've definitely noticed that the ebooks sales eat into our paperback sales, so if we publish in hardcover, um, you know, we're selling fewer paperbacks and, and subsequently than we used to, so... Well, I think it's different for, for back for older yeah, things. Right. I mean, we also have Aldous Huxley's Brave New World does tremendously yeah, well. Of course, adoptions too. So. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, but it, you know, and it's just easy. I, I I just think the ease of being able to to get them. But I could, I mean, the price it makes sense for paperbacks because of the price point, mm -hmm. and you can get the you can get the ebook as soon as the hardcover comes out. So I'm just curious about the economics of it because it occurs to me that you're right. The whole history of reading, at least in the West, is a history of enfranchisement through new technologies. You know, the Gutenberg Press replaces all those monks in the scriptorium, uh, copying uh, books and allows uh, middle class to start buying them. Paperback allows people to own books for the first time. I'm sure there were many families who never bought a book, who went to the library and never owned a book until uh, paperbacks came. Students would probably not keep their books unless they could keep a cheap paperback. So it's, it's uh, encouraging to think that uh, the Kindle and so on all, uh, will enfranchise more people. But then there's the question of, and I'd be interested in John hearing you talk about this, what the economics is of publishing online. Ethan brought up a good point that the writers are the most important and, and for us we depend on the writers to make this product every six months, right? And you mentioned some of the top name poets and writers that have sent us their work without even being solicited, most of them. Um, and uh, it's, I think, half of the appeal at least is to be in, a, in something that looks this good 
that has, uh, if the paper feels good, smells good even, um, especially when you open that box, it's fantastic. Um, but uh, very early on, and this is why I was glad that Amherst College Press picked us up, because my co-editors didn't agree, um, I wanted simultaneous online publication for free. And we, initially we delayed it by six months. Um, but, but when we came into Amherst College Press, they said, you must do it. Okay. I was advised by Don Sher, who is now the editor at Poetry Magazine. Um, and after Ruth Lilly gave that enormous gift, I'm, I'm sure some of you know, um, it, it, it was a couple hundred million dollars uh, to the Poetry Foundation, which publishes Poetry Magazine. They saw, they saw their subscriptions increase even as they made everything available free online. Um, of course, they've been around for a little while. You know, we're upstarts. Um, um, but they were rejuvenated by this gift. And you're getting yours free. You're getting your online presence free. So it's yes, it's, that's right. It's free. <laughs> and and we've, we've had seven issues. Our eighth is coming out soon. And at least three of them have sold out already. So. We're, we're doing okay, but we need Amherst College. You three are in a position of seeing trends before anybody else sees trends. That is, what writers are sending and what people are printing, whether print means virtual printing or paper printing. And I wondered um, if you wanted to share with us what's happening right now. And I also wondered whether the two trends are intersecting. That is, what writers want to send to you, is that what um, you as editors want to receive, or um, you as a literary representative want to be able to take to a publisher? Are those two different things? And I wonder if they, really whether things have changed in the 21st century in the United States. I'm really thinking since 9-11, since this is 9-11, because I expected to see it appear in our art. <clears throat> and of course it did in a very literal way. Uh, right away people were trying to rise to that occasion in poems and narratives and, and some not great films, but, um, <laughs> but in novels and stories. Uh, but I think the powerful response to that is still coming, still upon us and will be arriving from some subterranean spot. One of the writers that I work with, uh, this Irish writer, Kevin Barry, he was saying at a, at a sort of similar event to this, he was on a panel, and he was saying that he always thinks it takes about 10 years for like an historical event to kind of filter its way effectively into art. So I think that's maybe right, that we still haven't seen some of the real responses to that period in our history. I was thinking there might be a tonal change. But, well, um, I, I, I remember people were loudly declaiming the death of irony immediately after 9-11, and on about 9-16, I, uh, I was living in New York then, I was working for FSG, and I ran into um, the writer, Sam Lipsight, who's a friend of mine, and, and um, ran into him in Union Square, and his novel, he's a satirist, and um, among other things, but his novel had been published, its pub date was 9-11, and days after that, people were loudly declaiming the death of exactly what he was doing. Um, and he was just, you know, his publisher had called him and said, you know, we understand if you don't want to go on your tour right now. And he's like, no, no, I want to go on the tour. <laughs> so he's gone to have a perfectly fine career. So I don't really know about trends. I mean, what I'm seeing, and this is kind of obvious, I guess, is that, you know, almost all the publishers are part of these huge conglomerates and they're not, the editor's not something like Grey Wolf, but I mean, the, the editors for the most part can't make any kind of decisions on their own. They need to run everything by marketing and publicity and who knows what else. And what it leads to is that they're all looking not to the future in terms of what's gonna sell for a long time, but they're looking for uh, you know, what will make them hopefully, and nobody really knows when you're buying something if it's gonna be a big bestseller or not, but they're trying to second guess what's gonna be a big bestseller because it looks good for them. And the editors are, are, are being fired and are moving around so they're not really thinking about the future either because they don't know in five years if they'll still be in the same place. And so what I do see is that everybody wants or is you know, asking you know, big plot-driven 
big characters, lots of stuff going on. They're not that interested, uh, you know, in the actual language necessarily. Um, which is the opposite of what we. Which is the opposite of what all of us yeah. are doing yeah. anyway. So we're yeah. definitely having, you know, a tougher time. It takes longer uh, to find. Most of the time, it takes longer to find the right editor for a book than it used to. It used, to, you know, I know certainly. 50, 50 years ago, it was like you had your friends in the business. You called them up. I know this is the right thing for you, and they would buy it. I don't even, you know, I think that they didn't even necessarily read it, especially with the <laughs> French books that we were selling. You know, if, if, if you called and said, this is a great book, but it's in French, and they'd be like, well, if you say it's great, we'll publish it. Um, <laughs> so, it's, so that's a big change. I mean, it's been going on for a while. It's not, I don't think it was affected by 9-11. And are, there, uh, are you seeing a surge in plot-driven poems? <laughs> <laughs> no, Maybe I live more... in Western Mass. I, I, uh... Um, I think it's more about accessibility. It's, it's the epicenter of, of post-avant poetry where I live. So. <laughs> a zone that we're publishing a lot in and that we're doing quite well with is, is um, you know, I, I think there has been a real resurgence in the, in the essay and the kind of uh, mm -hmm. lyric essay writing. We're seeing a lot of hybrid texts that mix some, you know, memoir and criticism um, is something that we've had quite a lot of success publishing them, um, whether that ranges from... John Degata to Leslie Jamison recently, and I'm publishing next year Sarah Manguso and Maggie Nelson, and so we're doing a lot of these writers who are um, um, doing a really kind of creative sort of nonfiction that doesn't might not necessarily be very easily categorized. And uh, you know, I published the British writer Jeff Dyer, who also had kind of I think is pushing some of the lines between fiction and nonfiction in interesting ways. The question was, is, is transparent style more what people are looking for than elaborate style? Yeah, maybe. I, I don't know if I would put it in those words. <laughs> I, I just think they want things that are really straightforward. People, you know, they want things that are really more entertaining than educational. Or they just want, they want to know that something's going to sell a lot of copies. I, well, I, I would argue that in the kind of literary neck of the woods where, you know, because Grey Wolf, we often look at the sentences first, I would guess. Um, it's great if it has a story. I love stories. But, you know, they, the, the writing's got to be really good for us to publish it. And, uh, but so I would quibble with those two things being either incompatible with literary press or, you know, I think it's just trends and style happen. And, uh, you, know, you, can, you know, for a while there might be a lot of kind of maximalist, big, loping, Faulknerian sentences, and then there might be some really stripped down, dirty realism, and those are both great kinds of writing, you know, and so I think as a, I mean, Grey Wolf doesn't, you know, I think of some presses like, you know, Grove in the old days or New Directions even now had a, a very distinct sensibility, you know, they did a certain kind of writing and um, Grey Wolf is probably more ecumenical. So we would do something that was either maximalist or minimalist depending on if it was good. Well, I think that's something that's changed too, that, you know, you used to be able to distinguish the different houses and now, all, you know, yeah. a lot of them are so similar that, it, you know, it's no difference. They're all doing the same thing. If you have self-published a book, but it's been reviewed well by people who aren't the family of <laughs> does that make it harder to sell? Is that like a kiss of death in the old school publishing world? I haven't dealt with self-published okay. authors yeah. at all. but um, So maybe that's the answer right there. The question was, if you've self-published a book and gotten good reviews that weren't from family members, um, is that the kiss of death? Like, is it, I mean, is it possible to still get it published? I mean, it happens, you hear about it. I, you know, I think that, that sometimes there are editors out there who are looking, you know, to see what's sort of what's out there on the internet. And, and yeah, I think at, the, big, at the big commercial ha houses, that's certainly happening more and more that people are letting self-published authors kind of fight it out and see what works, and then they either pick up the author for a new book or republish the book that had been self-published in a smaller way. Well, the second part of my, of my question is, and this goes to something about or you were saying, with the, uh, uh, the way that the, 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 I guess the identity of the major publishers now, if a really indisputable, undisputable masterpiece came out like Ulysses, and everybody recognized it as a great book, 
how would that actually be marketed? Would you would you take it to a major house? I mean, if, if, you know, okay, where did we smooth that? Well, how would they handle a real old masterpiece if it came out today? I'm sure they would handle it like almost everything they handle. They would have like no budget to, you know, <laughs> for publicity, and they would let it drop somewhere. I, I don't know that they would do something different for you for Ulysses than any other book. Oh. I just want to say about Ulysses, Virginia Woolf turned it down for Hogarth Press. So uh, I also read recently a, an incident uh, of his trying to publish Dubliners in Ireland on his last trip back to Dublin, and no luck there. So I wanted to bring up actually with Elie Wiesel, I have a letter from Scribner's from 1958 that says, Dear Mr. Borchard, thank you so very much for giving us the privilege of reading Elie Wiesel's La Nuit. It is, as you say, a horrifying and extremely moving document, and I wish I could say this was something for Scribner's. However, we have certain misgivings as to the size of the American market for what remains, despite Mohiak's brilliant introduction, a document. So, I mean, for all I know, if Ulysses was, was being, you know, shopped around today, people would just be like, this is incomprehensible. And <laughs> but, which, but which a lot of people said then. I mean, Moby Dick, people said that about, you know, Walt Whitman self-published Leaves of Grass. I mean, these are not news stories. Yeah. Uh, and Stephen Crane paid people to read uh, The Red Badge of Courage on the New York subways. <laughs> <laughs> and it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> got rich after he died, as many do. If E.L. James suddenly came out with something that really was on par with Ulysses, <laughs> would she be able to get published by, and, and read um, by like, people who go for literary work rather than just commercial I mean, I'm really happy when we have a, an author that we you know, we think all our authors are literary, even though it's kind of a bad word in the industry now. But, you know, when one of them turns out to do really well, which is, you know, when they're suddenly called commercial, we're, we're really happy. I don't know if Ulysses is a great example, just because it's like, you know, if you're using something that difficult. But often we have authors who, who are, are complex and write beautifully, and, you know, all of a sudden, they're published by, you know, I had a book uh, called The Year of Fog by a woman named Michelle Richmond, and I had trouble selling this book. It's, it was, and it turned out to be a bestseller on the New York Times bestseller list. I sold it to Bantam, and it wasn't my first choice. And they saw the literary, the commercial potential in it, and it did really well, but it was still a literary novel. So there is crossover. I think a lot of the kind of boutique imprints that the big literary publishers, that's exactly what they're looking for, is um, mm -hmm. a book that's well written, but that has, um, you know, interesting characters and good stories, and that, that's what they think can sell a lot of copies. So I would say, I'd say there's probably a publisher dying to read E.L. James for a, a literary audience. I mean, also, Vintage republished E.L. James, you know, one of the great <laughs> literary publishers in the country. I've been waiting to get an editor in the room to ask this question. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen more and more journals now doing with the Commons Living, where you've got both physical presence of magazines and you have an online presence. And in many cases, some of the work that's published online never shows up in the print. Excellent question. I know exactly where you're going. I do my best because I'm also a poet. You don't want to be marginalized. I think the ideal is to have your poem appear in print, reprinted online, included in Best American Poetry, and then end up in your book. Okay? <laughs> right? Uh, so. I will never take anyone's work. Uh, now, we have different editors at the Common, okay? I don't want to step on any toes, but, but I will never take anyone's work for online publication if I haven't already accepted it for uh, print publication, except in the last six months because my backlog for print was 18 months long, and I, I wrote and I said, if you want to wait, Okay, you can send it to me again in 18 months, or I can publish it within the next three to six months at the most online, and then we, and, and we have a deal. 
you always send your work to me and I, I'll get back to you quickly. It can come right to my email and I'll, I'll do my best to get that poet's work in the print journal. But it, it's, it's an excellent question. And I remember thinking that about 10 years ago when um, a couple of the, the big, solid, old quarterlies started doing that. Started publishing things online that they and would they, not publish. They would say, well, we won't publish this in print, but we will include it online. And it was clear that that was a lesser form of publication, even though more people are going to read it. Do you either of you see ebook royalties as reaching 50% in the next 10 years? You know, the industry standard right now for ebooks is, is that um, publishers are paying 25% of the. Oh, is that what your question net. is? How much they're paying, or, are they, or is it 50% of. I'm sorry, maybe I can. Royalties. Oh, we get 50% for some things. Do Never you? mind. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it's not the industry standard by any means, but yeah, if, especially, um, you know, with a lot of our books that were already uh, under contract with publishers where the contracts didn't have oh. ebooks in them, you know, there are ebook companies that are giving 50%, but uh, yes, I do see it going up to 50%. Because we're seeing it a lot already. When looking at an unsolicited period, what is the minimum and maximum time, roughly, you will give a uh, unsolicited uh, period? And is there any message, that a message behind the reasons that some many uh, representatives give as the reason for rejecting? Can you read anything and put a hidden message there? <laughs> it's just... um, does anyone in this group look at unsolicited queries? Um, Grey Wolf doesn't accept unagented prose. We do accept some unagented poetry, but it's trickier with, uh, probably with um, big, big book publishers rather than literary journals, say, who, which also get a lot of queries, probably. I don't know, I mean, I think um, I wouldn't read too much in them. If they're very simple, then they're probably just not right for the person you sent it for, and you should move on and not overthink it. And never try to argue back and convince somebody, because What's the point? <laughs> but writers are always going to read rejection notices yeah. as if they were reading love well, letters. The only, I mean, I guess the only, looking if somebody's for, actually read your looking work. Looking for affirmation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess if somebody's actually yeah. read your work and you've gotten some response, if you're hearing, if you're having trouble getting an agent or something and, you know, you're getting a million different responses and one person liked Bob but, but didn't like Cindy and the other person liked Cindy but didn't like Bob and one person loved the story but not the writing and another person liked the writing, you know, if you're hearing just a wide range of responses, you just probably haven't found the right person and you should keep plugging away. But if you're hearing kind of a similar sort of reaction, then you've probably got a problem you need to address before you send it back out. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you uh, write notes to... Um... I write notes, yes. Although it's gotten harder because um, now everything is done electronically and, and we're given these forms. When I used to get paper submissions, I, I would always write something or at least initial it so they knew that I saw it. And I read everything that comes to me. And when you when you wrote those notes, were you just being nice, or did you hope that person would, no, would I, send something? No, I was to taking you? up my time. Oh, right. Okay. Do, do you know? Seriously, I'm, people do find my email address and send me unsolicited queries, and you know I'll respond to them, even though we, technically we don't um, take them. But most of the time, I'm rejecting them because something's just the person is clearly not familiar with what we publish. So that that is like the most common and annoying thing that happens. Oh. Uh, when do you suggest emerging writers when the writers start sending out their work? As soon as you're really happy with what you have. Like if you think it's ready and it's finished and you're, you're ready to let it out into the world, then you should send it out. Don't wait. Would you say oh, yeah, absolutely. Soon. <laughs> when you're ready, you're ready. When, and when you know where it should go, send it there. If you have to ask people, you, you need to go, you're not ready. And you, I mean, if, if you need to ask, where should I send this, uh, go yourself and read them. I'm, I'm answering in terms of magazines. Go read the magazines. It's so easy now. You can get caught in a wormhole and find lots of different journals, even print journals, just spending an hour or two online. I, I say, though, go to the library, look at the print journals, and, and if, if you see where your work belongs, send it there. Mr. Kosowski, you mentioned that you've been seeing a rise in nonfiction and essays. Can you, can you tell us more about that? Um, essays, of course, can be various kinds of essays on the scene. What kind of essays do you select? And I invite all of those. Well, 
I should say a lot of these things are starting in magazines, whether it's you know The Believer or Tin House or Granta or you know wherever. But I, I just think it's um, I'm seeing. I guess I'm seeing a, a bit more formal innovation in um, in, uh, in some of the nonfiction essay writing that I'm seeing in fiction, with, where a lot of the sort of experimental work I think is similar, or what we what people are calling experimental work is awfully similar to the experimentation that's been going on for 40 years. So it's just, um, but it ranges, I and mean, we do so, you know we do some essays that are you know pretty straightforward. I'd say you know Leslie Jameson's essays that have been really successful this year are, are you know fairly <laughs> fairly traditional essays, but from a perspective that feels a little bit new. Uh, some of them are a little formally odder than others, but, um, and, uh, and, and others go, you know, we're publishing a book by Cla the poet Claudia Rankine that are effectively essays, although she's a poet, and uh, they're much more um, <laughs> lyrical, I guess I would say. So are you selling more nonfiction then? We've always e sold, e we've e always fiction. sold more non, I mean, nonfiction's always been easier to sell. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it just, I, you just need a good topic, so. Yes? What are your opinions on the rise of young adult literature being read by all ages? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not against anyone reading any kind of book for any reason. I guess my, uh, my only thing I would say, since I feel like I've been baited, is <laughs> if, if you're an adult and that's the only kind of thing you read, I don't know. I mean, you know, challenge your, challenge your thinking a little bit more. <laughs> that was harsh. <laughs> I, I'd say if it's the only thing. I mean, I just, you know. At I, least I, you're I, reading. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I just feel like, yeah, I, I agree that as long as you're reading something, it's good. It doesn't bother me. Some of those are, are very good books. Yep. I just reread The Phantom Tollbooth several years ago. It was awesome. <laughs> really great book. He's an Amherst study. Really? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that's that a funny. young adult. Or a young adult. I guess that's a kid. That's a middle grade. That's a middle grade. I don't publish any young adult. Okay. I've never worked with a publisher. That's okay. not true. FSG has an awesome children's list, but um, I've never really, I've never edited any of those books, so it's not a realm that I know very well. This is an honest question. Is there now a young adult poetry? I, yeah, I think I just, I literally think I just read something about this the other day. I think there should be. Uh, I have a colleague sure who is. calls certain literary poets, um, how else do I, should I put this, well-known poets, YA poets, but he doesn't mean it as a, as a I see. I mean, what about like Shel Silverstein? Yeah, I was going to say Shel Silverstein, yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. Robert Service, I don't know, that's all like. Way in the back. Uh, at what point do you think it's appropriate for the writers to look for a literary You mean for story collections? At what point look for an agent yeah. rather than sending to magazines and publishers? I think after you've had a little bit of success getting things published, it's a really fine line between, um, at least from the literary, like from when we want to take people on, it's a fine line because we don't want to take it's risky for us to take someone on too early when they're not really ready yet. Um, but at the same time, if we read someone and we see that they're, they're going in the right direction and, and we have confidence but we can't really do anything for them yet, it's a little bit too early and then we worry that we're going to lose the opportunity to work with that person because someone else invariably will, will snatch them up if they're really talented. But, you know, I would say after, after you've had a little bit of success getting some of those those stories published somewhere, um, you know, so that you can at least get someone's attention by saying, you know, I've been in, in these three, four, five places and, and I feel like now I'm ready to, to have representation. And, and your work will get better as you're edited. You'll learn more from the editors that you, hopefully, from the editors that you work with at the magazines and then your mm -hmm. work will get better and you'll be better able to get an agent or a publisher. It's true, it depends what you're working on too. You know, for poets, you just gotta like, publish in a lot of journals, you know, before you start. The, I mean, they don't have agents, but um, generally. Um, but, uh, you know, before you start looking for a publisher, I guess, you just gotta really rack up the publication credits. But if you're working on a novel that's super hard to excerpt, and you've finished your novel and you're happy with it, and you can't think of how else to fiddle with it, then look for an agent. 
and get ready to hear no a lot. Yeah, you have to have thick skin. I was going to say that earlier, that, that if, be ready to, to hear no also. Be sure that you can handle yeah, that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. How much of a role do agents play in actually shaping the manuscript? Totally depends how much the, the author needs their work uh, edited before it can be seen, uh, how, how good the relationship is, how, you know, if, you know, some of my clients, I, I, you know, I have a feel for how offended they're going to be by a suggestion that I might make, and, and others are really open to it and happy and, uh, and happy to get them. Some authors deliver things that are almost perfect, and some deliver things that are a mess, and you know you have to work with them before it goes out. So it really, it really completely depends. It's there's no hard and fast rule. In your work, how much time can, can you or and will you spend with an author? I, I mean, I try not to move a book into the production department, and if I still think it needs a lot of work, I mean, I just I try not to schedule it. So you try to do the work. Um, you know, we do, we certainly do a lot. Every place I've worked, there, there's been a lot of editing done. And I, I do hear about books that have just really not gotten edited um, or not edited well. Um, I, I know it happens. But everywhere I've been, I watch editors working really hard. And they, now, what should be said is that, it, I'm sure this is true of agents too, that, you know, your, your day in the publishing industry is mostly taken by meetings, phone calls, and emails, and you know, marketing meetings and God knows what, and editing and reading manuscripts usually happens at night or on the weekends. So it depends how much you want to work. There are so many journals around. Can you say why you want to create one? Yeah. Quite, there are a lot of new journals, and with so many out there, why would you create a new one? It wasn't my idea. <laughs> <laughs> but I jumped on really quick. Um, <laughs> No, I, I, because, thank you, because you let me say something. Um, the, uh, my co-editor had the idea that she wanted to start a journal with, with the idea of um, place being central to the work, okay? And, um, and when she presented that to me, and then someone else asked me to, to do the poetry editing, and, okay. Um, but but I, I interpret that very loosely, and sometimes the, the site of the, uh, in question is the poem itself, okay? Um, but, but, it, but what it did appeal to is, is my interest in Anglophone poetry from all over the world, okay? Uh, and so with this interest in place, I said as long as that means we can do a kind of atlas or a map of, of Anglophone poetry, that's great. We also do some translation, but our focus is primarily Anglophone work. Um, and that, so that's why I, I felt like I had the right or whatever to, to go ahead and create that. But the fact that there are so many journals should inspire you, people who are, are just now starting to set out, right? I was going to ask for last words you wanted to leave these writers uh, with, and um, maybe we should ask you um, how you get into your professions, too. Like what, if we, what if we want to be editors and agents? Let's see, I piled up a bunch of fairly useless literature degrees, um, and uh, so, and I, and publishing, and I wasn't a writer, and I didn't want to teach, so publishing was all that was left for me. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, honestly, that was kind of true, but uh, I, you know, you start as an assistant, and you just stay around long enough and hope to get promoted, which is um, what, I, what I did. Um, I think the one thing I would say you know, a lot, there, there's been a lot of talk at the beginning of the panel about the death of, of literature and, or death of publishing or is, you know, is, are people going to be reading? Where is writing going to happen? And I, I think it's actually a tremendously exciting time to be a writer. Um, I think there's a lot of good writing going on and a lot of different ways to publish, more than there's been certainly in my lifetime. And as much as, um, you know, the industry is changing, I think it's a super interesting moment and I've seen tons of good work and they got, they, there's a legendary guy who works at City Lights Bookstore in San Francisco named Paul Yamazaki who's been buying books there for this store for 30, 40 years and um, they've had their three best years in a row these last few years and he thinks we're in like a golden age of, good, of interesting and good writing 
um, that we'll recognize later. So it depends who you ask and what your perspective is. But I do think, I mean, you know, when I was growing up, it seemed like, you know, you had to be either like an experimental writer or a traditional writer or a commercial writer. You have to be one of these things. But it seems like a great, there doesn't seem to be a sort of a dominant school of writing anymore to me. And you can be such a magpie now and, and drag, you know, pick from experimental traditions and traditional traditions. I think this goes for poetry and fiction and, um, and nonfiction. And so I, I don't know, it just seems like a, a great moment to um, where a lot of the tools that are in the writer's toolkit are available to you. Um, well, in terms of becoming a literary agent, I guess it helps to be born into the family, <laughs> if that's what you really want to do. Um, but uh, the, the, the people who we hire, you know, they, they studied literature. We're looking for people who are really, you know, if you want to go into publishing, I'd say be really well read um, and, and love reading. And then, you know, it's like, like anything these days. You go get an unpaid internship in a literary agency and and hope that they take notice of uh, what a great person you are when they hire you. And that, and that is pretty much how we have hired people, so. Yeah, that, you have to be willing to work for nothing for a while. We, we met for something like two years before we even produced a single issue. It, it didn't help that we started at the end, December of 2008. Okay, right, right after the crash and um, but I, you, you said leaving. I wanted to show you this. I brought a bunch of props, okay? Um, this is The Wolf, and it's, it's edited by James Byrne from uh, the UK. And this is, the, it's a, a poetry journal that also has essays, but it's strictly poetry um, oriented. This, this, I only discovered it recently. This is more like what I had in mind, but, but they, um, they do include a lot of translation, and their focus is on global poetry, not just Anglophone. So the book is going to survive. Sure. It's still alive. You have to have a day job, even if you're going to be an editor, break into editing or um, um, agency. Um, and, um, or if you're going to write. Or if you're going to write. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah, even if it, But I, and I would also add, though, that this is... Um, I think anybody writing in English is at a, in a very lucky moment in the cultural history because English is getting bigger every day. It's a welcoming language, and there are languages, uh, and there are governments that are putting up their hands to stop new words from crossing the border. There have always been language ref reformers um, in other cultures, but there's no language reform in the United States, and maybe um, uh, the, the language will be even richer tomorrow than it is today, and even richer next year uh, than it is this year. So uh, uh, there should be a voice for everyone uh, who wants to, to find a voice with this language.